Section 3 of Beware the Usurpers by Robert W. Kreps. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adam Binkeser. Chapters 11 through 15. Chapter 11 Where can we talk? I asked him quietly, when I had got control of myself. Why, here, General? No, no. A good, safe place, where we can talk privately, and without interruption. Oh, all mags, of course. None better. Your room or mine? Mine, I said. Let's go, old horse. We went, taking along a bottle of gin for medicinal purposes. I sat him down in the dilapidated rocking chair in my bedroom, and staring into his brown face intently, said, I've got a proposition for you, Harold. It's a whopper, too. Big job, he said. You want me on a big job? Yes, you. You'll be my partner in it. Me? he repeated incredulously. You're the one chap who can help me. The muddy eyes actually filled with tears. It was not a maudlin drunk's easy weeping, though, but the honest emotion of a humble workman who finds himself asked to assist a master. You want me, Harold Smith, to link up with you. A gent. A real gent. Class. What I mean a tough as ever was. Cor. I knowed I wasn't through yet, said he. Just you lead on, General. I was only a captain, said I. Then you didn't have your deserts, I'll say. What's the game? The biggest. Banker England? He asked without much astonishment. No, not theft. We don't have to steal anything in this game. He frowned. Hold on now. You mean I gotta knock somebody off? Scrag em. Not you personally, Errold. You'll be too high in the game for that. Oh, not that I objects, mind you, he hastened to assure me. It just took me off guard. As you might say, you're not looking like a basher. He grinned. T'wouldn't be the first mug I've did in general. I'll wager on that, said I under my breath, and aloud. I told you, you'll be too important in this affair to do any murdering yourself, Harold. I prodded him in the chest with a finger. You'll give the orders, said I. He was deeply impressed by that. Cripes, he said. Me? Yes. Now listen closely, and I'll explain the whole business. Think back. Remember that purple monster you saw leaving the pub? Not off. Holy hell, not off. It was something like a lizard in shape, I said slowly. It had a long trailing tail, and two big hind legs it walked on. It had two sets of little forearms, only they weren't like arms, but more like big snakes. No fingers, no hands, just oozy, rounded arms. It looked as if it had just crawled out of the sea, and around it there were a lot of thin, silvery-blue lines, running at a tangent like this. I chopped my hands through the air at a 45-degree angle. That seemed like a background to the creature. There were glowing eyes in its chest, and for a head, it had what looked like a dead fish. Right? Right. He gave me a long, blank stare. Then he batted his lids up and down. How did you know? I never told you all that. I saw it too. Gone, he said scornfully. What you giving us? If I didn't see it, then how did I know just what it looked like? He thought that over, sucking his yellow teeth. Then he gasped. My God! You got him too? Do I look drunk? No, but... And if I were, would I have seen exactly what you saw, unless it were really there? 
Harold Smith sank back in the rocker and let out a wheeze that began in the tips of his toes. My old mother. I'm off it for good. The snakes are catching. Ah, who are you, mister? I threw my whole hand into the center of the table, staking everything on it. I'm the Manchester Slasher, I said. He recoiled. His brown face, incapable of turning pale, nonetheless gave the effect of blanching in some mysterious manner of its own. The common little thief and garden-variety mugger quailed before the celebrated mad ghoul of Manchester. He drew out a large clasp knife and snapped open the blade, his hand shaking. Here now, you keep back from me, here. I'm not to be trifled with, see? You touch me and you're a debtor, that's what. Oh, put it away, I said fiercely. When he refused, I grabbed his wrist with my left hand and struck at a stinging judo blow with my right. The knife fell. Ow! he yelled. You keep back! Cowering, he gazed at me with those muddy crimson eyes wide, his mouth stretched in a nervous, sickly grimace of fear. Twenty, you done in. All in a couple of dies, he whispered. And I been and gone and drunk with you, like you was my brother. You're mad dog crazy, you are. I'm as sane as you are, I said. Or saner. For heaven's sake, man, get hold of yourself. Do you think I stood you a bucket of gin and wasted two hours on you just to murder you in my own room? Well, no, he said grudgingly. Up north, I killed four in the time I've taken to talk to you. I said to impress him further. Now listen closely, because I don't want to go over this more than a couple of times. In the first place, those people I killed weren't people. Gone. They were beasts, like the purple lizard. Some of them were worse. I killed one that was like a giant hop toad with fangs. I've seen them like that. Eh, what you giving us? I know them oars is all in my mind. I ain't no common Lushington. I knows it's the gin. I know they're folks like everyone. Oh, you know, do you? Open up that walnut you call your mind, chum. Why do we both see the identical brutes if they're in your mind? I don't know, he growled sullenly. Then just sit quiet. There's the gin beside you. And I'll explain it all in words of one syllable. And this I did. I went over the whole frightful business, with a side dissertation on the theory of a fourth dimension. Then I went over it again. Somewhere in the distance, a clock struck two. I summarized it again. I could see it beginning to penetrate to his submerged intellect. I went through it all a fourth time, and his murky gaze began to glow. The faraway clock struck three. Eh, he said at last. You ain't loony at all, are you? Tell me again about them as is in it with you. There's an old colonel, a real big gun in his day, with pots of money. There's two veterans, gentlemen both, and one the son of a lord. There's a doctor with plenty of brains, and an old chap with more dignity than you ever saw in your misspent life. There's even a girl, a real lady. And there's me. Do you think we'd all be chucking our lives into this mess if we didn't know it was desperately real? He scratched his nose with a black nail. No, he said. No, you wouldn't. I can see as your real class... Ripper or no? What do you want of me, though? I'm plain dirt compared with you. Why, you were Manny Jarman's right-hand man, I said. You haven't forgotten what it's like to be top dog. He was immensely flattered at that. Thank you kindly, General. You sees deeper into a bloke than most. Go on. I've only a hazy idea of what I want you to do, Harold, when the time comes. 
but here's an important part of it. Could you find me a whole raft of fellas who'd be willing to commit murder for money? No questions asked. Hell, he grinned. Could a cat find garbage cans? They'd have to be given definite instructions, and be the kind of men who would carry them out to the letter. And no coppers knock, see? Nobody who'd take our cash and then squeal. I could do it, he said, thinking. I could get bullies here and brummage him, who'd cut their mother's necks for three quid. And they could get others. Oh, trust Harold Smith to find a writings. We might need a hundred. There's that many and more. I was giving slow birth to a real plan now. It might be that they'd have to go all over England and do these murders in a hundred different places. They'd have to do them in a certain manner you'd tell them about, see? No slipshod hatchet work, but well-planned assassinations. Might be harder to find them as would work precise to orders, but I could do it. I know every rogue in these parts. Don't you doubt it, General. That's why you're so valuable, Harold. That's why you'll be my right-hand man. And only you and I must know that the men we'll be killing aren't truly men, but... But usurpers, agreed Harold, proud of the new word. Usurpers from the Fourth Demented, yes. Why, General, it's like a crusade. A bloody noble crusade, ain't it? That's what we think, pal. But that part's a deep secret. Hot knives won't drag it out in me, he bragged. God, to think I've been seeing these here Frankenstein's monsters for eight years, more or less. I thought all the time it was the gin. He made his apologies to the liquor by taking an enormous gulp of it. Now I've got to go away for a while, Harold, I told him. I've got to travel all over this island and collect some names. When I've done that, I'll let you know. Meanwhile, you can be lining up your lieutenants. With care, old horse. With the greatest care. Then it occurred to me that he had never asked what his reward would be. You'll find yourself a rich man when this is over, Harold. Gone. What do I do with a lot of money? I don't need much but gin and a few comforts now and again. And maybe a bit of cash to swank it with around town. You'll be able to build a swimming pool and fill it with Gordons if you do your job right. Trust old Errol, General. I do, I said. I do. That's damn near thanks enough, said he in a choked voice. There was a stratum of pretty fine stuff in Errol Smith, besides the streak of sentimentality you'll usually find in your lower-class Britain. Now, I went on, here's the plan. I'll go over it until we both know it word for word. I sketched it out as it had come to me in this strange night of lengthy explanation. Then I repeated it, and re-repeated it, until I thought it would bubble out of our ears. And when the clock rang five, we were nearly ready to begin. But first, we laid ourselves down to sleep for a few hours, till the pubs had opened again. When we arose, and put on our coats, and sallied out together to commit a murder. A most unpleasant but most necessary murder. Chapter 12 I walked out of Birmingham alone, just before noon, heading for the bombed-out old building in which I had left the Jaguar, with my Gladstone bag locked in her dicky, or rumble seat. I had not carried any baggage with me into the city, except my razor, toothbrush, knife and automatic, and my pipe. It occurs to me that since she played nearly as useful a part in my adventures as did my human colleagues, I should perhaps devote a moment to describing my black jaguar. I had bought her late in 1937, for a matter of some 400 pounds, and except for the war years, which she waited out in a barn near my home in Coventry, we had been inseparable ever since. She was one of the mighty standard Swallow 100s, with a wonderfully reliable three-and-a-half-liter engine, and as I've said, 
I once clocked her at 114 miles per hour and believed she could do more. She would go from a standstill to 80 miles per hour in a matter of 20 seconds, for her acceleration was ferocious. Yet she was the smoothest riding jade I ever owned. Her brown leather upholstery had faded through the years to a rich old tan, but her heart was as young as ever. I had lavished on her the affection that might more properly have gone to a wife or a kennel of hounds. In my lonely careering about the countryside in these last days, she had amply repaid me. She had been companion and steed and confidant to a very homesick man. It was a clear day, with a promise of sultry heat to come that prickled my body with sweat under the old tweed suit. I tramped briskly along, thinking of Marion. I thought of her whenever I could, for her sweet face shut out the menacing usurpers from my mind, until I came in sight of the wrecked building. As I swung down the hill toward it, I heard voices raised in argument. Cautiously, I slowed a little looking nonchalant and disinterested. I walked past the ruin, and from the corner of my eye saw a number of men, and monsters, clustered around the jaguar, looking at her curiously. Oi, said one of them, that's his right enough. Black jaguar, it says here on the prince. Two of them were constables. I ambled over. Now this was a particularly idiotic thing to do but I must plead extenuating circumstances. In the first place, I had just been a partner in the commission of a messy homicide and was strung up as high as a barrage balloon. Secondly, I had been hard-headed and coldly practical for many hours. Indeed, since the night of my last murder in Manchester, I had not done an impetuous act, nor played the swaggering gambler with death for any stakes except the highest. It suddenly came to me that I must do a doughty deed, act the bold Quixote for once, to liven up my interest and tone up my reflexes. I was never born to be an ice-brained plotter, although I had been forced by fate into that uncongenial role. Rather for me, the swirling cape and impetuous rapier, the big plumed hat and gallant gesture, the fiery and slightly ridiculous beau geste, so I ambled into the wrecked building. The men and monsters turned to stare at me. I could see the great brutes of aliens turning orange and green with interest. I had learned that they often swelled and changed color when intrigued or alarmed. Chiro, I said vacuously. What's up? One of the group, a portly constable with a red face, eyed me dourly and said, Stranger you're about, sir. I'm on a walking tour, said I. Just spent a night in Birmingham. Saw you chaps in a rum sweat over something. Thought I'd have a deco. Dash sleek looking car, what? Ah, oh, said the constable, observing my boots. They were stout and old. The very thing for a walking tour. You know anything about motors, sir? Me? Lord, no, said I. I then giggled, which pained him visibly. I wouldn't touch one. Cousin owned one, name of Algy. Cousin, you know, not the car. Turned over in a treacherous manner and simply squashed him like a blooming bug. What's up with this one? The monsters were scrutinizing me intently. I told myself that I needn't be afraid of their inspection, in addition to my quite ordinary features, which could scarcely have been described in much detail by their compatriot who had seen me. I was at the moment wearing the shell-rimmed spectacles which I ordinarily used only for reading, being far-sighted as an eagle. I had put them on a few moments before, just in case. An alien said, leaning his human form toward me, We think it may be the Manchester Slashers. If he thought to startle me into betraying myself, he was disappointed. I fluttered my hands and bleated, Gad! Not that murderer, chappie! The one who killed about ninety people up north. Twenty, sir, the alien appeared to relax. Yes, it fits the description all right. He turned to another. Tom, you'd best go and telegraph Manchester. Sam, 
You go with him and bring back another couple of boys. We'll just lay us a trap. I walked all about the jaguar, prodding her bonnet and peering at the dashboard gingerly. Deuced mysterious affairs, Motors, I said. Don't see how anyone can tell what gadget to push next. We're a-going to lay an ambush for this here slasher, sir, if you don't mind, said one of them. Hear, hear, I said. Chop the blighter, what? Pip him in the early counties, right? There's liable to be trouble, sir, insinuated another. Rather, I yammered. Oh, rather. We'd like to get ready now, if you please, sir. Oh, absolutely. Carry on. Lay a snare for the wretched person, lads, said I heartily. You'd better leave now, sir, said the constable firmly. Before there's trouble, you know. Wouldn't want to get hurt. Heavens no, said I. I say, officer, could I just sit in that seat a mo? Give one something to boast of, what? No, sir. There may be fingerprints in the thing. I won't touch a bally thing, I assured him. And as there was no one within six feet of me, I hopped in behind the wheel. At once they all shouted angrily, but there was no suspicion of me yet. It is the firm belief of the lower middle classes that anyone who bleats and says bally and dashed is a regular birdie wooster character and as harmless as a sheep although somewhat less attractive. "'Come out of that, sir!' yelled the constable. "'Just want to get the feel of it, you know,' said I reassuringly. "'Want to tell old Algy I sat in what's-his-name's seat. "'I thought you said Algy was killed in a wreck.' "'That was Algy Witherspoon, my cousin,' I told him reproachfully, secretly extracting the ignition key from my pocket. "'This is young Algy Pope, my other cousin.' Regular ripping chappy on murders and all that, Algy is. Tell you all about Crippen and hoosies that did in his maiden aunt over at that little place in Sussex. And all such bloody, pardon the expression, goings on. Likes birds, too. Sits about in swamps watching them. Deuced rum, fella. Suspicion must have dawned just about then. They moved toward me, while the humans still hesitated. I slid the key in under cover of my bent body, chortling something inane about the mythical algae, and stepped on the clutch. A hand was laid heavily on my shoulder. The jaguar leaped backwards at the same instant, hit someone who reeled away with a scream, rocked crazily over the rubble and struck the road. I twisted her madly around, waved my hand in an appropriately cavalier-like manner, and sped off southeastward on the great road that leads to London. Shouts of rage followed me. I patted the jaguar's wheel. Everything's all right, baby, I said. Old wheel is back. It'll all be all right now. I devoutly hoped that it would be. Chapter 13 It is a hundred and fifteen or twenty miles from Birmingham to London. Having gambled the fate of the world on a silly trick and won back my two-seater from the very hands of the law and of the usurpers, I was wonderfully buoyed up, and decided to go down to my gang's headquarters and tell them all the new developments. I was aching to talk to someone, preferably Marion. In half an hour, I had left Birmingham and then Coventry far behind me, and was feeling pretty safe, as there had been no signs of pursuit. Then... Just as I roared into some cursed little hamlet along the route, I don't even know its name, a great black motor dashed out of a lane ahead of me and blocked the way. I saw it was crammed to the roof with them, knew that this was no accidental barrier, but a contingent of the enemy, either lawful or of the misbegotten underground of the beasts. And without pausing, ran the jaguar up over the curb, squeezed through between their car and the wall of a shop, rocketed on two wheels back into the road, and trod the accelerator down to the floor. The black job was after me in a flash. We howled through that hamlet like a pair of greased lightning bolts. They gave me only a few bad minutes. When we hit the open road, I drew away as though, 
to coin a stunning simile, they had been standing still. But even when their dust was no more than a puff on the horizon, I gnawed my lips and worried. My course was known, and the telegraphs and telephones would be crackling far in advance of me. Yet doggedly, and perhaps rather stupidly, I held to this main road until I had come nearly to St. Albans, for I could eat up the miles so swiftly on decent paving that it gave me the illusion of outrunning my enemies. At last, just before the old cathedral town, I turned off and lost myself in the networks of country byways. Evening was closing in when at last I rolled the black lass to a halt at a garage in the south of London. The owner was an old mate of mine with whom I'd seen a lot of action in the war. What lies I told him don't matter. Suffice it that in three minutes the jaguar was stowed in a dark corner of his big shed and he had contracted to paint her a deep red hue by next afternoon and to keep quiet about her. Gladstone in hand, I then set out for the Grey Gander. I told myself that, A, I would be less conspicuous there than at the Tony Gloucester Club, or the exclusive Albany. B, although three of my men were billeted at the latter place, Alec Talbot was the most able of the whole band, despite his single arm, and he was at the inn. C, I did not want to be seen by any of the aliens who knew me. I hardly realized why, but I had the creepy feeling that they would somehow penetrate my secret. And on the single occasion when I had visited the gander, I had seen none of the beast folk. Finally, I admitted to myself that these reasons were so much wrought, and actually, D, Marion Black was drawing me like an irresistible whirlpool draws a chip of flotsam. I went up to Alec's room, closed the door behind me, and fell on his bosom. He beat me on the back and gurgled wordlessly. I beat him on the back and sputtered idiotically. It was a grand reunion. "'Where's Marion?' I asked. "'I'll get her,' he dashed out and brought her back. When she came into the room, lighting it up like a sunburst in a cavern, I took her in my arms and kissed her long and well. "'Marion,' Will you marry a poor devil who loves you in a humble but most passionate manner? After one kiss? asked Alec blankly. Just one kiss? Certainly, she said. That can be remedied. Oh, Lord, not immediately, groaned Alec as we began to do so. Let him tell us where in hell he's been for seventeen years. Let him relieve my mind. I ended the second kiss with a splutter. Good God, I can't ask you to marry me, dearest. I... Come and sit down. I'm a murderer. You can't call it murder, son, to chop an inhuman monster, said Alec. But I'm wanted by every policeman in the kingdom. You see, I'm the Manchester Slasher. I don't know what reaction I expected of Marion. The pale cheek the indrawn gasp, the expression of loathing and fear. As a matter of fact, she clapped her hands and laughed. You owe Jeff ten bob, Alec, she cried. Huh, said I. Jeff bet Alec ten shillings that you were the mad ghoul. He said, she became serious, he said that one just couldn't give a man the power to see such nightmares as you've been seeing and expect him to keep a cool head and not strike at them. He said he had wild bursts of fury himself when he thought of them, and knew if he could see them, he'd start a reign of terror. I thought you'd draw back with abhorrence, I said. She threw her arms around me. Oh, Will, poor old Will. My Uncle Geordie was a big game hunter, and I think he was a much more reprehensible character than you. After all, darling, the beasts you're stalking are far worse than any innocent old family man of a lion. Say, put in Alec, something's been puzzling me. Why haven't the coppers spotted the license of your jaguar? It's famous, you know. On the wireless every hour these days. Oh, my dear chap, I stole a set of plates off a big Daimler before I ever left London. 
You're dealing with a hardened crook. I told them how I had rescued her from the hands of the enemy in Birmingham. It was the serial numbers on her innards that worried me. Except for them, though, she couldn't be traced to me. I kissed my girl again. Her lips were like a drug that drew me back again and again for larger doses. Alec clucked his tongue. Most un-English. See here, chum. You trot out and collect the lads. Have them come here unobtrusively, by ones and twos, and we'll have a council of war. Oh, all right, if you don't want an appreciative audience to make funny remarks at appropriate places. He slapped on his hat and went out, while I returned to Marion's embrace. For a little while, I could forget the whole abominable race of beast people, the dire venture before me, and everything else, except the incredible fact that she returned what I had always considered my hopeless love. Chapter 14 It was grand to see my half-dozen Sub Rosa Crusaders gathered together again, sitting expectantly on sofas and chairs in Alec's room, watching me with friendship and love. What a tonic those comradely faces were. I drank a silent, sentimental toast to them, and began my yawn. First, I told them of Harold Smith, the cheap, crooked, gin-soaked little man who had taken his last bath in 1922. The man who could see the usurpers as well as I could. That roused them to gleeful vociferance, which I squashed with a bark. Quiet, will you? I'm half-starved, haven't had a bite since breakfast. I want to get this done, so I can go and eat a good dinner. You know that when I left you, I could see just one dismal possibility. A long campaign of slaughter, slaughter, slaughter. But when I met Harold, a plan grew up in my mind. Like a lovely flower in a swamp, murmured Jeff. Sorry, pray continue. The whole plan, I growled, is about nine-tenths sheer bluff but I think it may work. Here it is. First, I travel around the country and collect a hundred names, the names of usurpers whose human shells have had more or less spectacular careers. Not those born to the purple, but those who've come up like rockets, self-made men who've climbed to posts of importance in politics, the law, and elsewhere. I've seen a number of big shots of that sort, who are nothing really but robots, moved by slimy, misshapen blobs. And I've deduced, pardon the Holmesian expression, that the important members of their loathsome breed are probably those who rise to take over important positions in this world. That allows them to protect and to advance their secret cause. How? By passing certain laws and, well, here's an example. One of them commits some crime, perhaps inadvertently. They don't want him to get chucked into prison, where he'd be no use to them in furthering the birth rate. So a ware policeman, to coin a name, will let him escape, or a ware judge will set him free. Get the poisonous subtlety of it? They work themselves into posts, where they can help each other to the top of their bent. Even on the lower levels, they're often bartenders and hotel keepers, who can pass quick word of developments and so forth. It's as if a lot of Nazis had become lawyers and judges and MPs here during the late fracas, and from their exalted seats had protected whole battalions of lesser spies when they ran afoul of the cops. I see, said the colonel. That's logic. So it stands to reason that, if I want to put a great big crimp in their plans, I have to chop a slice off the top of their organization rather than out of the bottom. I slew a score of them while I was the Manchester Slasher, but those were common low folk, whom I can't see as especially important to the general plan of the usurpers. They got very peeved about me, but it was nothing to the way they'd have acted had I murdered twenty judicial ware people, or twenty husks of members of Parliament. My score of twenty lowercase aliens might have been accidental, but twenty upper-crusters wouldn't be. 
in a hundred will make them sit up and scream like hell. You can't hire decent men to commit pointless assassinations, so of course I was handicapped until I met Errol Smith. In fact, I never even thought about hiring killers until that night when I found that he could see him too. Then the dawn flashed up. You can pay professional rogues to commit murders, and no questions asked. So I deputized Errol to go out and collect a hundred scoundrels for me. The most reliable riffraff available. Men who would, as he says, do in their mothers for a chew of tobacco. He's to pay them ten pounds apiece in advance, with a promise of ten more when the business is done. Then, on a certain night, and within a period of a few hours, they're to strike all over England, and slay these usurpers I'll have collected in my little black book. I understand that the underworld looks with disfavor on a gentleman who collects a fee from a brother crook and then doesn't deliver the goods, so I believe that most of these cutthroats will keep faith and comply with his instructions. How do you know this smith won't do a bunk with your money? asked Dr. Berenger cynically. After all, a common thief. Not common, said I loyally. He was Manny Jarman's right-hand man. Who in blazes is, or was, Manny Jarman? Haven't the foggiest, John. Anyhow, Errol's been promised a lot of cash if he comes through. He's enthralled with the scheme, for after all, he's been seeing these pink and crimson caco demons since the early forties. Lastly, and maybe most important, he knows I'm the Manchester Slasher, and in his heart of hearts, he's scared white of me. I felt no qualms at all about giving him eleven hundred quid. Alec whistled. What a wad! Nearly all I had with me. It's a lucky thing some of us are loaded with the ready, for this affair will cost like sin. Then, after our pogrom, I call one of their bigwigs and tell him to meet me somewhere, with as many of his pals as he wants to bring. I say to him, Gents, You've just seen a sample of my power. I've reached out and obliterated a hundred of you. And they weren't any small potatoes either, but some of your finest. You realize I didn't snag them all by myself. You're no village idiots. Those killings were done by a hundred chaps who can see you. We struck at you all over England. In a few days, another hundred of you get it. And some of you here now are on that list. A couple days later, a hundred and fifty, then two hundred, and we'll go on knocking you over regularly, working from the top down, till there aren't any of your breed left here, and damned good riddance to filthy bad rubbish too. Then I make my point. The nub of the thing is this. We want you to go home. Pick up your kilts and vamoose. Beat it. This world isn't your world. And by heavens, you'd better leave it while the leaving is good. Otherwise, you're sunk. You can murder me now, I tell him generously. But there's plenty more where I came from. We've perfected a system of warping our vision. And every day there are more of us who can see you in all your ugliness. You can't beat us. Because we're the best underground organization that ever existed. And last night's massacre proves it. Till now, you had no idea we even existed, did you? And they have to admit they didn't, because we don't. How's that again, Will? Never mind. Anyway, then they think it over, and if we're in luck, they decide the hell with it and go home. Leaving thousands of suddenly dead bodies and incredible misery and sorrow among the friends of their puppets said Jeff. Oh, I'm with you. That's our whole objective, to rid ourselves of them. But it just hit me. What a lot of tears will be shed because we stepped into this matter. Shall we turn back now? Don't drivel. Only... Great merciful powers. He drank from his glass, his hand shaking. 
What will we wreak? Do you think it'll work, Will? Asked Marion quietly. It's the biggest bluff of all time, darling. But it must work. I paused. There's one big factor I've hinted at. Here it is. We've always taken it for granted that when the human body dies, the usurper simply goes back to his own world and begins again by getting himself born into a new husk here. Jerry Wolf figured that out originally, and we've accepted his theory as gospel. But I submit that it needn't be true. I don't know why I ever thought it was. How do we know what happens to the monster when its whole of human flesh dies? How do we know that it's only the puppet which perishes? Echo answers, We don't know. Maybe the aliens are so bound to their false humans in this dimension that when the bodies die, the aliens must die too. What's so impossible about that? After all, I've told you that they haven't any powers here except those of the bodies they inhabit. God knows what they can do in their own never-never land, but here they're little better than so many natural-born people. And if they're that restricted, that much identified with these puppets, maybe even their death is mutual. I cleared my throat and took a drink of scotch. What happened when I killed my first ogre? I went to a pub with Jeff and watched. Pretty soon, all the beasts sitting there started to flap their arms at one another and turn different colors, and then a lot of them got up and left. Aha, yes, I said to myself. The Gorgon who got his has gone around behind the dimension screen telling his chums about it. But... I was arguing from a false premise. I was basing my ideas on what I believed to be a fact. Yet that fact hadn't been proven at all, and probably couldn't be proven this side of the Silver Land. Nor disproven, put in Alec. But I can show you more to disprove it than you can dig up to prove it. What happens when I assassinate an alien? His human vehicle croaks, while he himself swells up, turns a vivid, horrid hue, and goes pop. I submit that that looks more like the death of the alien itself than a simple relegation to another region. But I think they can leave this world voluntarily, in which case they go on living in their own. Lord knows how long a life expectancy they've got over there. Maybe their time is different from ours, so that the life of a man occupies no more than a fraction of a day in the Silver Land. The theft of a body and the puppeteering of it from womb to tomb may be no more than an hour's vicious pastime for an alien. I've been thinking of that, said Jeff slowly. I see this whole business as a kind of fierce joke on their part. The slow and sly winning of a world from its unseeing inhabitants. So perhaps they'll leave us if their lives are endangered. Perhaps the joke may not be worth dying for. All this, interrupted John Berenger testily, is off the track, and really no more than so much anthropomorphism. How can a man finally and definitely state what are the purposes of a pack of inhuman beings? Go on, Will. Well, to prove my new theory, Harold and I went out to a pub this morning. We chose a frightful creature that was doing some solitary drinking, and Harold who's a wizard of a lad at such matters, slipped some slow poison into his liquor. We watched him die, in the throes of agony, which was taken by all the other denizens of the pub for simple indigestion or appendicitis. It took him twelve minutes to die on the floor. I timed him. The first three minutes, he just writhed and changed colors and shot off angry sparks. He didn't know he was dying. I refer to the real entity, not the human part. Obviously, he could feel the pain. They must be able to. Otherwise, they'd give themselves away by not making the human body jump when it's stuck with a pin, or sits on a hot stove, or what not. You can see that. Well, after those three minutes, he seemed to wake up to the fact that this was it. Immediately, he started to leave this dimension. It was the damnedest sight I ever laid eye on. It was like a man trying to haul himself out of quicksand or heavy muck. 
The beast wrenched upward and jerked back, and did what in any normal being would be called shrugging his shoulders, for all the world as if he was mired in something and wanted to get out. He had an awful time of it. Took him seven minutes and fifteen seconds. But at last he made it. He oozed back and away from that twisting body on the floor. He stood there, weaving and trembling, and I'll bet he was sweating, too, if they do any such prosaic thing as sweat. He was entirely divorced from the husk, which lived, mind you, for more than a minute after he'd left it. But as soon as he'd stepped away, he began to fade, and within three or four seconds he had vanished, at any rate from my sight and Arold's. I signaled to Alec to fill my glass. That's why I think they die when I murder them. Because of the time it took that critter to get loose from his puppet. He was scared. I could feel it. Just as I can feel their ordinary waves of hatred and abominable passions. I could sense the terror that filled that usurping bastard when he knew his husk was dying. He was purely scared to hell. Why? Why? unless he knew he'd die in both worlds if he couldn't rid himself of the shell before it perished. I sighed. I was tired of this whole rotten business and lightheaded from the liquor on my empty stomach. I said, It was what I'd wanted to discover, why we poisoned the thing. I'd recalled that every alien death I'd seen, every one Jerry Wolf saw, had been sudden and quick. I'd realized that there were no data on slow deaths. I had to have some. I got it. And I say, it's two to one they die when the human part dies, unless they have plenty of time to get away from it. That's the reason I think they'll leave us voluntarily, in a terrific hurry, when they think there's a whole crew of seers after them. They don't like death any more than we do. Death's a queer and uncanny thing. Nothing that I know in nature likes to die. But how did the aliens in those pubs of yours learn so quickly about the killings? If the one who was killed... I mean the one... Marion frowned angrily. If the one who'd been relegated didn't go around behind the scenes and tell them. Oh, dear girl, shouted Jeff. Messengers! Errand boys! The Pony Express of the Silverland! That's it, said I. That's what we never thought of. There must be plenty of them who don't have human bodies at all and move freely in their own dimension. What's to keep them from spreading the word to their comrades when one dies? Will, you've hit it, the colonel said. They die here. It's probable. It's the best news yet. And if it's true, the bluff will work. And now that I've lectured you for an hour, I said, reaching for Marion's hand, Let's go out to the best restaurant within walking distance and have us a monstrous dinner. I could eat the proverbial horse. There's a place within two blocks where they give you a delightful Percheron steak, said Alec. Let's travel. Chapter 15 We ate a noble meal, sat long over the port, and came out into a deep July night canopied with a velvet turquoise sky in which the full moon was riding high. We began to stroll along, talking of inconsequential things. At the corner of Baker Street we split up, the others heading for their own digs, while Alec and Marion and I went toward the inn. As we passed beneath a lamp, I happened to glance over my shoulder. I do not know to this day whether I heard the footsteps or sensed the hate aura of the beast or perhaps was warned by the primitive instincts that I had been developing through the past weeks of terror. Whatever caused it, I peered back down the street and saw one of the aliens following us. In the moonlight, his human body was a dark form within an envelope of gray-blue mist. Coincidence, I told myself, angry to feel the sweat leap out of my face and palms. Nonetheless, I had a second look in a moment, just as the thing was walking under the lamp. I was rewarded by a strange sight. In the flood of brilliant light, I saw the puppet body of the man, all stark and clear and black, with the distorted form of the usurper about it, flaming like a gaudy, transparent rainbow. 
It was an awesome spectacle, and sent the cold grew racing up my backbone. Alec, I hissed from the corner of my mouth. I'm going to stop in a minute. Take a good look at the bloke that's following us. Then we halted, and to give us an excuse, I took out a cigarette and lit it. The monster passed us. I thought the moon-grade protoplasm had a tinge of orange, which might indicate deep interest on the being's part, but I could not be sure. When it was out of hearing, I said, Anyone we know? It's a man from the restaurant, said Marion. I noticed him looking at us as we ate. I thought he was flirting with me. He gave you a damn hard stare, Will, said Alec. Jerusalem, I growled. Maybe a coincidence, but he's one of them. And I let him have a ruddy good look at me with that match. Could he have chased you from up north? No. No. Nobody followed me on the roads I took, son. But he and his gang have my description. I threw away the cigarette angrily. Of course, I look like anybody else, but... You do not, protested Marion. You're very handsome, for one thing. Alec laughed briefly. Well, maybe not that, Will. But you are individual enough to be spotted from a good description. I was astonished. I had never thought so. I said, We've got to be careful, then. Can't let him see us go into the Grey Gander. We walked past our inn. The creature had disappeared. We went on a short distance, and then I felt from the prickling of the hair on my neck that he was behind us again. So began a game of cat and mouse, which took us around corners and fleeing through alleys, until at last I felt we had lost our silent pursuer, and with a sigh we entered our tavern. I was awakened next morning, as I slept uneasily on Alec's couch, by Dr. John Berenger. He was puffing a pipe and grinning, but his eyes were shadowed. "'What's up?' I asked. "'Everybody but you. "'Will, there's a lashing of people about in Baker Street. "'I don't know why I noticed them especially, but they're there. "'Just standing, or sauntering, watching folk pass. "'It struck me queerly, and Alec tells me you were followed last night. "'I started to dress hurriedly. "'Do they look like policemen?' "'I wouldn't say so.' John mused. They're just ordinary people, men and women both, standing in the sun. I can't say I like it. Nor I. Are they concentrated near the inn? No. Within a block or two, though. I didn't begin to notice them till I'd passed that restaurant where we ate last night. Alec came in. You were right, he said to John. By God, you were right. Forty or more loitering. Will's got to get out. Will's got to lie low, snapped the physician. They obviously don't know just which building he's hiding in. He'll have to stop here until the fiends give up. Or at least until I can slip out at night, I said. I say, does it occur to you that the blighters now have all our descriptions? We were under observation last night for an hour or two. Call... Alec was already pouncing on the phone. He rang through to the Albany, spoke ten words, and hung up with a long face. The Colonel and Jeff are out. That means they're headed here. Too late. By the powers, we're dished. Maybe not, I said hopefully. It could be coincidence. And I could be the lost to fawn of France, said Alec gloomily. He put in a call to the Gloucester Club got hold of Johnson, and told him to stay there till he heard from us. Then we waited, fretting, for Jeff and the colonel, who came in blithely at ten. We sat there, staring at one another morbidly, and argued and plotted futilely through a dragging hot hour or two. It was dreadfully hard to decide on a plan, for now it was not a question of getting me out of London, but of finding a haven for all of us. You've got to collect a hundred names, if you hope to put that affair of yours through, said Jeff, chewing his pipe stem. You can't do that sitting here on your well-cushioned behind. 
Your chum Arald will be gathering his ragtag army in Bromachim, and you've got to be ready to use him. Look here. Why not we form a flying wedge and bust you out of here right now? If they're not coppers, and they didn't smell like the law to me when we passed them, they won't stop six of us in broad daylight. Wouldn't dare. We'll take Alex Rolls and ditch him. Then we'll split up out of London, and you can put on a false beard and go it alone if you like, or with one of us as sidekick. How's that sound? I don't want to leap into it with both feet, I said. Let's wait it out a bit. Maybe there's nothing in it. Maybe those people simply like to loiter in Baker Street. Maybe they're tourists, watching for Watson and Holmes. Dismal worries about the safety of Marion and my friends were crowding my mind, preventing rumination. So we argued until luncheon, which we ordered sent up to the room. After which, John went out to reconnoiter. He was soon back. Still there. There's no mistake. They're watching for you, Will. I couldn't be sure, but they may have noticed me, too. He scowled. I hope not, but they're clever as sin. So, mainly because I was too unsure of myself to risk a bold move such as Jeff had suggested, we waited out the first half of the afternoon in the rooms of the Grey Gander, and nothing happened at all. End of section three.